Right. So, uh, just to give a little background as well, um, there's a teaching on the German Revolution that was held on Tuesday in Chicago. Stephanie Gomez uh, presented on it. Um, there's been a panel on the German Revolution that was held in uh, Germany a few years ago. Uh, the transcription's in German, unfortunately, which I don't read, so I don't know. So, uh, Platypus Review is also published in German. It has its own, the German Platypus Review, with its own articles. Um, and then, I don't know if it's happened in New York yet, but Richard Rubin is supposed to do a presentation on the German Revolution. And we had met on a call to try to divide things up on what kind of things people would talk about. And Stephanie wanted to focus on Rosa Luxemburg. We watched the Rosa Luxemburg movie a few weeks ago. Um, I wanted to sort of take a Leftcom and Kautsky, which is sort of a trend that I see coming back right now. So there's been something called the Marxist Center, which has emerged in the last few years, which has groups, um, part of it, everything from Maoist groups to parts of the DSA, the Refoundation Caucus, um, to like the Communist League of Tampa. And Redneck Revolt, I believe, was part of that there. And uh, Richard Rubin was going to take up sort of later uh, 20s kind of the Stalinization of the common term. Um, and then next week in Chicago, we're going to be speaking at the University of Chicago at 6 on sort of the outcome of these teach-ins. And then finally on the 20th, we're going to be having a panel with three people on this. So the point of this teaching was to try to get a lot of uh, kind of background information, whatever people find interesting, um, so that when we have a panel, they're not hearing about the German Revolution for the first time, which is often the case with a lot of people, because uh, it's sort of something um, that we are uh, haunted by in a negative sense, as opposed to the Russian Revolution is like this successful one, and the German Revolution is kind of just martyrdom now. <laughs> there was a revolution in Germany. Yeah, there was a revolution in Germany. Which one? The Nazi Revolution? Yeah. Right, so. Um, is this one like really, really not well known at all? Uh, yeah. Okay. And in a lot of ways, uh, one of the books I used as a background uh, for this was Sebastian Hafner's Failure of the Revolution. And he wrote it because one of the people I'm going to be talking about today, Rosa Luxemburg, she gets murdered about 100 years ago. Um, literally, it was January 1919. And he published this book because the captains that were, uh, um, what's it called, that were, uh, that like murdered her? Well, the captains also that were responsible, so the Freikorps Corps was an organization. They basically were like redeemed or something, like they were acquitted, basically. And he's like, oh God, this means actually the history has naturalized the course of events as that's what had to happen. And they could acquit it as like, you know, it's a terrible thing, but it was in defense of the sovereignty of the nation or something. Um, and then this Sunday, of course, we're uh, actually reading Rosa Luxemburg's final pieces, including her final piece less than 24 hours before she's murdered. Uh, okay, so I wanted to start off uh, with a point that Rosa Luxemburg made in a speech she gave on uh, the Spartacus program in December 1918, uh, December 30th, so nearly 100 years ago. Um, even in the opposite camp, even where the counter-revolution still seems to rule, we have adherence and future comrades in arms. Uh, this may seem strange today. Here, Rosa Luxemburg, someone who was murdered by the counter-revolutionary Fry Corps, is claiming that people in the camp might themselves be future members of the Spartacus League. Right, so members of the counter-revolution might be future comrades in arms. Indeed, her murder was sanctioned by Frederick Ebert, member of the SP Day and former comrade of Rosa Luxemburg. He's in pictures with her, standing right next to her. How could this happen? So to give a little digression to kind of set up the uh, German Revolution, I just wanted to talk about things leading up to it, and then we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, democratic revolutions were carried through like a lion pouncing on the top of the nation. So the classic example, see right here, 1793, it's the Great French Revolution. And it's, an, you know, have kind of these three estates here, right? These are the priests, these are the knights, and you know, I might as well say this is everybody else, but they would say we're the producers in a sense. 
And the classic revolution was that these people, the producers, could form a nation and they could live without these two groups, the priests and the knights. And so they consolidated themselves and then pounced on these groups like a lion. And that was known as a democratic revolution, right? The people. An arbitrary power corrupted by bureaucracy and special interests by a people who united would never be divided. Political organizations was usually late or almost absent for most of the people. There wasn't really anything that needed to be done. We just had to get rid of these people. After all, the ills of the nation were concentrated in a very particular group of people. And furthermore, the revolution was basically complete. So a famous pamphlet from around this time that we've read, the uh, What is a Third Estate? Literally, Abby C.S. says, Will you two estates, the priests and the knights, you can leave the nation if you want. We can do without you. But you can't leave us. We produce everything that you eat, all the roads, everything you need. So the political act was just then one of removing barriers to actually a consistent society. It was, this is the nation right here. The nation, or the people. And these were arbitrary powers. Feel free to jump in if any of this is confusing or you want to make comments or heckle. Or not. Okay. A people may itself, may give itself to a king, says Grotius. He was this famous political theorist. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the radical of the 18th century, responded accordingly. According to Grotius, a people is a people even before the gift to the king is made. The gift itself is a simple act. It presupposes public deliberation. If there were no earlier agreement, how, unless the election were unanimous, could there be any obligation on the minority to accept a decision of the majority? What right have the hundred who want to have a master to vote on, but half of the ten who do not? The law of majority voting itself rests on agreement and implies that there has at least been, uh, on occasion, unanimity. So it's from the social contract. The bourgeois revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries justified themselves in a radical way. Rather than humanity being the product of the benevolence of a king or emperor, so usually what we're kind of taught here, like I can imagine in my middle school history class, is that this was a divine chain of being, right? These are the priests, it's the king, they've been ordained by God, some kind of manifest destiny. Yeah, and like God, angels, humans. And angels, yeah, it goes down and then. Great chain of being. Right? The great chain of being in this case. And uh, that this was the basis for humanity, literally. Right. So basically, this estate lived at the expense. They were extensions of the body. So there was something in the Middle Ages, the body politic. And it was literally like, this estate is limbs, and this is the brain, and this is the body. So the bourgeois revolutions flipped that. Rather than humanity being a product of the benevolence of a king and emperor, the result of a divine chain of being, a natural order perhaps, the king presupposed the people that granted them power. So that was Rousseau's flip right there. He said, no, in order for people even to say, where your people are, you know, royal highness, they've already agreed to be a people. There was something before that. So you can think, Abraham Lincoln. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. That was the radical flip from all previous human history right there. The ability of the king to break the law was only justified on the ground that he preserved the people. In other words, what basis could he put someone to death? It was if it preserved society. They had broken some sort of contract. So, quoting John Locke, uh, for since many accidents may happen wherein a strict and rigid observation of the laws may do harm, as not to pull down an innocent man's house to stop the fire when it is next to, when next to it is burning, it is fit the ruler should have a power in many cases to mitigate the severity of the law and pardon some offenders, since the end of government being the preservation of all as much as may be, even the guilty are to be spared where it can be 
proving no prejudice to the innocent. So what right does one have to pull down a house when it's on fire? Well, because if it spreads, it threatens everybody else in society. But that would be breaking the law. You're breaking their property rights. So the kind of bourgeois revolution was rather to grant property as coming from the people in that sense. So a king could not arbitrarily do it. He couldn't just show up and go, it's my house now or something like that. But if it could justify it in the name of the people, then this was known as the executive prerogative. The power to act according to discretion for the public good without the prescription of the law, and sometimes even against it, is that which is called prerogative. The old question will be asked in the manner of prerogative. But who shall be the judge when the power is made a right use of? I answer, between an executive power and being with such a prerogative and a legislative that depends upon his will for their convening, there can be no judge on earth. As there can be none between the legislative and the people, should either the executive or the legislative, when they have got the power in their hands, design or go about to enslave or destroy them, the people have no other remedy in this, as in all other cases where they have no judge on earth, but to appeal to heaven. That appeal to heaven, by the way, is revolution. <laughs> That's the point. In other words, what is the grounds that people can appeal to when the king has infringed upon them? Something that's got like rights. They, they can overthrow them, yeah. Um, behind the necessary myth of some covenant, that there was some social contract that sometime in history on January 1st people met. I assisted in talking to Yeah, 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 perfect. Thank you. Um, and you came in just at the, we kind of just started this well. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so behind this kind of necessary myth uh, that, I don't know, sometime in history, there were people walking in the forest and they kind of formed a contract or something. Whether or not that actually happened, the point is that was an idea of reason upon which someone could judge whether or not the revolution was justified or not. Revolution is illegal, and anyone who does it can be justly put to death. There is no right to rebel. Right, so I'm quoting now here. So on what basis did the bourgeois revolutions understand their acts? They understood it that the kings had infringed upon the contract of the people, they had made war on the people, and the line that pounced on them did so out of self-defense. In other words, ABCS says, well, the first and second estates, they exist outside of the law. They're not even part of the nation. And so we confront them in the same way that the trees confront ants or anything else. Yes? I'm just trying to clarify something. What you're talking about with like the king, I guess, taking liberties to make decisions as long as they're in the name of the good of the people um, was like kind of the objection to that, the idea that, that that's according to his own judgment of what is good for people. Because like, uh, I, I imagine that that would, see, that would be acceptable if like, I don't know, the people actually had a say in what they thought was good for them and then the, the king just sort of executes it. But I guess like the conflict or the objection is that the, the idea was like they were making decisions supposedly in the name of people, but without their input at all. Or not even in the name of people. They uh -huh. were just saying that I have the right to do with my kingdom as wanted. Without even, without even the facade of it being for the good of people. Sure, yeah, okay. right, that I'm like their uh, shepherd, right? That's so the divine rights of the king and then their authority uh, um, comes from God. with their yeah. uh, claim that God is they're, they're the voice of God. God is their authority. In the uh, Abbey C.S. pamphlet, he says, you know, the only right you claim is that a thousand years ago you guys conquered us. In other words, the right prior to what we understand now is the right of conquest, which is just that, well, I won the end. <laughs> and thereafter, I'm the boss. Yeah, yeah, really. Like, it was, you know, most of human history has just been conquering people. Might and right. Might, yeah. might is right. And so the radical bourgeois revolution was to say, no, there has to be some sort of contract to it. Even if that never happened, it reconstitutes everything in society as it has to be voluntary to some degree. In other words, it had to be implicit. So yes, the king could break the law, but it would have to be justified according to the preservation of the people. You know, and that doesn't mean, by the way, my next quote was gonna be, that doesn't mean there wouldn't be disputes on whether or not that was true or not. So uh, for example, um, the appeal to heaven that Locke spoke about was the outcome of things. So Thomas Jefferson to James Madison on the Shays' Rebellion 
Uh, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. As necessary in the political world as storms in the physical, unsuccessful rebellions indeed generally establish the encroachments on the rights of the people which have produced them. An observation of this truth should render honest Republican governors so mild in their punishment of rebellions as not to discourage them too much. It is medicine necessary for the sound of the health government. Healthy government. So he's referring to when there was a rebellion that happened in the US and it was put down by the US government. A lot of the founding fathers were like, put them to death, right? They're traitors to the nation. And Jefferson was kind of like, you know, it's who knows? A, it's a symptom of something is what he's saying. Well, he's saying there's a symptom, but also if it was successful, maybe it would have to have justified itself in the name of the people. In other words, he says an unsuccessful revolution would encroach upon the rights of people. So the idea coming out of the 18th century, even though the bourgeois revolutions had been happening for some centuries, was that the way that a revolution would justify itself was in the name of the people. The people united will never be divided. We hear this all the time. Democracy, a government for the people, et cetera. The spring of 1848, the spring of nations, which is what Karl Marx experiences when he's a young communist. In yes. regards to the revolution phase, I guess it's kind of interesting to see how a revolution sort of like proclaims that it is for the people. Yes. But in essence, they're kind of regime changes on democratic. So like Nazi Germany, for instance, um, they were all about like the people, the Volk. Oh yeah. Um, and so that could be that that could be in, in itself used to justify giving away rights, I mean, taking away rights for the people. Oh, absolutely, yeah. In other words, the whole point right here is the executive prerogative is the grounding of rights in the first place. In other words, before any laws are even established, this is why I had the quote from Rousseau and Crocious, before you even say whether or not the majority vote is binding to somebody, there is the assumption about, you know, society in general. Hi. Um, so the Spring of Nations in 1848, which is what the young Marx and Engels experienced when they were in the Communist League, um, starts out in the same way as a kind of uh, French revolution. By the way, this little section in my talk is called, eight, it's called 1793, 1848, 1918, in reference to the Trotsky chapter we read. Why don't we talk about uh, 1789? What's the difference between 89 and Let me talk about 1840. That's, yeah. So the Spring of Nations started out in the usual way. Uh, the National Guard was quote unquote disarmed, which really just means they went over to the people, right? Because at the time in France, for example, there was um, Louis Philippe, who at first was known as the uh, People's King, right? Coming out of the kind of Les Miserables Aero Revolution of 1830, the July Monarchy. And, um, uh, you know, eventually it turns into like a financial aristocracy. It's a very classic bourgeois revolution. There's a vested interest, there's a financial aristocracy, they're referring to their tradition, and the National Guard, in the name of the people, overthrows the government, and a provisional government is established. Uh, but something new had emerged since the 18th century. When the workers demanded a labor ministry be set up to guarantee the right to a job, Others raised an objection. Isn't the Ministry of Finance and Commerce just as much a condition for labor? Right? Like, where are you going to get a job if we can't borrow? Right? If we can't pay off our interests, for example. The workers demanded their political rights. They demanded universal suffrage. But that would mean using force to decide the outcome of something that was done voluntarily. Because the political rights of the workers would have demanded, I don't know, ownership of the factories. But that was the property of the capitalists. Democracy had become contradictory. There had been something that had changed since the 18th century, and already this revolution was a little too late. Right? It was already a late one. But now something really new had emerged. The people could be validly represented by two contradictory poles, what Marx called wage, labor, and capital. The interest of the masses was in both. You know, today we might say, you know, who's the capitalist? It's like Bezos or somebody or whoever that billionaire is who's trying to impeach Trump or something like that. 
But really, all of us have an interest in capital, in your wage, right? In the productivity of society, in the powers of society. You also have an interest in your immediate life. So all of us are contradictory. Do you have a question? No, yeah. just common. I mean, it doesn't yeah. make you capitalist, right? You're, you're selling your labor. It's like, there's still a, there's still a, a class antagonism, though, right? I mean, well, so the what I was going to get to is the class is a contradiction of self-contradiction, meaning it's not one of different interesting groups, which could then be still democratically decided, but rather one that even if the capitalists weren't there, the contradiction would still be. And that's what rendered democracy contradictory. Capitalists don't necessarily have to be unified in thought, I guess you could say. Um, they could even be uh, politically uh, opposed to each other, and they often are. Um, and they were at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was a lot of the industrial capitalists were against the financial capitalists, in a sense. Um, so uh, not antagonistic groups, that was literally my next sentence. But a contradiction in right, the same person could have contradictory views. As a result, no one unique group could represent the whole of society. Rather, democracy could be constituted in two contradictory ways. It could be constituted by labor, it could be constituted by dead labor, capital. Hence, the class struggle. Both the proletariat and the capitalist could seem like representatives of the nation. So there's a famous line from capital, between equal rights, force the size. You know, in other words, workers can claim the factory as their property. So could the capitalists. Who decides? It was a contradiction that had emerged in the uh, rights of society in the democratic revolution. So quoting uh, Lenin, uh, for the majority in the state to really decide, definite conditions are required, one of which is the firm establishment of a political system a form of state power making it possible to decide matters by a majority and guaranteeing the translation of the possibility into reality. That is one thing. Another is the class composition of this majority and the interrelation of classes inside and outside it should enable it to draw the chariot of the state concertedly and effectively. Rather than waiting for a vote to decide, one had to constitute the executive prerogative first. The executive could uphold two seemingly contradictory rights, right? Like in other words, this king, you know, who is he gonna, who is he gonna uphold? Who's right to uphold? This is true from Rousseau to Lenin and Luxembourg. Literally, this is why the dictatorship of the proletariat is not the end, but the special higher severity of the class struggle, quote Lenin. This fact, to be blunt, is something I think almost the entire left, especially the Marxist left, has forgotten. Even when they critique the current constitution of democracy, which they will call bourgeois democracy, they nevertheless substitute out the old powers of vested aristocracy or its priest or something with the capitalists and financiers. As a result, they repeat an anachronistic goal of politics. For example, the 99% versus the 1%, the billionaire class. The tradition of all dead generations waits like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Everything I talk about today is going to return to this point. What set Luxembourg apart from basically every socialist in Germany at this time, from Karl Kautsky to Frederick Ebert, to the left communists like Otto Ruhl and Hermann Border, who considered themselves completely opposed to Kautsky and Ebert, was precisely that she pursued the contradictory character of a proletarian revolution. The reason why counter-revolutionaries may be future comrades in arms, as she said, or adherents of the Luxembourg program, was because of this characteristic, this problem of the modern revolution. In a lot of ways, it's more difficult than this. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, two thoughts. Uh, one is, yes. it seems like we're on the level of uh, like uh, law, or what's legal, and that there's a, uh, there's a, a basic contradiction that people can claim uh, as uh, capital and what is claimed as wages. So you're saying that the proletariat actually somehow are enfolded in capital uh, uh, legalistically? Well, so the legal would be the, you know, quote unquote superstructure, and this is the base. Right. 
The bourgeois revolution was literally a revolution in the name of labor as right. Right, so we were talking uh, before some people came in about, you know, how was uh, basically property decided in the past? It was conquering people. And so it was Mike that decided right. So the Abbey C.S. pamphlet again, he says, the only right you claim is you conquered us a thousand years ago. Right, it's, I don't know, the Gauls in, invaded or something. Um, or had centuries ago. Whereas the uh, bourgeois revolution was rather that property should be according to one's productivity. Right? It was luck. It was you mix your labor with the land. And the point is that the Industrial Revolution, which kind of comes between this period, I mean, it's here already, renders labor as right contradictory. And the expression of that is that the democratic will of the masses can be expressed in different ways. So the law is rather, you know, like, you know the old law idea of the spirit of the laws? Right, you've heard of this, the spirit of the laws? which is that they've already happened in civil society and they're given kind of legalistic form. So it's not that there are contradictory laws, which there would be no problem if that was the issue. It's like, write a better law. Right. Go get an NGO to write a better law. It's rather that the basis of right in civil society, which is antecedent to the law. So this is historical. You have to understand this is a historical yeah. condition, not legal condition. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm gonna quote some more Luxembourg and she'll Directly put it. And my yeah. second point is, uh, it, it seems then that to anticipate what you're saying, I guess, is that the dictator, dictatorship of the proletariat has to act because there's nothing that can, like that's the solution to the inherent contradiction. Uh, so is the dictatorship of the proletariat going to break laws and look like despotism? Necessarily so. Right. Necessarily so is the point. Meaning, you know, Engels has this great letter to Babel when he goes, uh, any revolution is going to be opposed in the name of democracy. Because you can also claim a different right. You can say, no, this is not democratic. So Marx's discovery is there's something imminent in, in this historical development. Yeah. yeah, that's the, once it's a tragedy, then it's a farce. So a young 28-year-old Rosa Luxemburg writing at a, or talking at a congress in Hanover, October 1899, wrote, what does it mean to say that previous classes, namely the third estate, took economic power before their political emancipation? Nothing else but the historical fact that all previous class struggles can be traced to the economic fact that every new ascending class also created a new form of property on which it finally based its class dominance. The artisan struggle against the city nobility in the first part of the Middle Ages depended on the fact that as opposed to the property of the nobility, which consisted in land, they created a new form of property which depended on labor. That was a new economic creation which finally burst the political change and reshaped its own image, the remnants of feudal property, which had become meaningless. In other words, the French Revolution is like the last thing. Like already that society had been created. And now she's about to flip this. The same thing was repeated at the end of the Middle Ages when the middle classes led their fight against feudalism. I'll skip that part. Now, I ask, can this model be applied to our situation? No. Precisely those people who prattle on about all the economic power of the proletariat overlook the huge difference between our struggle and all the previous class struggles. The assertion of the proletariat in contrast to all classes leads a class struggle not in order to institute the rule of one class, but to do away with the rule of any class is no empty phrase. It has the basis in the fact that the proletariat creates no new form of property, but only extends the form of property created by the capitalist economy by turning it over to the possession of society. Thus, it is an illusion to believe that the proletariat could create economic power for itself within current bourgeois society. A little bit later, Bernstein criticizes Marx and Engels for applying the schema of the great forever. French Revolution to our situation. Yet he and the other adherents of economic power apply the economic schema of the great French Revolution to the struggle of the proletariat. So I wanted to set up these things because when we're talking about 1918 and it's breaking out, I just want to give some assumptions that actually a lot of, you know, not just Luxembourg, but all sorts of different people are going to be having in the back of their mind. So any questions just in terms of that, even though some people are like, I came here for the German Revolution, why are you talking about France? All of a sudden. All 
All right. Okay. So leading up into 1918, right here. Okay. So here are going to be three groups to kind of talk about in this sense. So I'm trying to give some background to all of them. So this is the SPD. This is the uh, Social Democratic Party in Germany. Um, after Marx's death, there was a huge growth in Marxism, literally, in Europe. And uh, one of the parties that he had at least a founding criticism in was the SPD, uh, the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Um, they were kind of the center of the Second International. And uh, some people I'm going to talk about today, Lenin, Luxembourg, and Trotsky, I'll just write LLT here. Uh, were members of it. They were kind of young radicals in the Second International. They were actually of the younger generation, so the older generation were people like Wilhelm Liebknecht, Karl Kautsky, August Babel, what kind of uh, these people. And uh, famously, the German SPD on August 4th, 1914, voted for war credits, right? It was a horrifying thing where basically you know, to paraphrase Rosa Luxemburg, uh, rather than unifying the class, they voted for the class to slit each other's throats. Right? They voted for the German imperialist uh, war, you know, and not only that, they, were, they weren't even just voting for defense, they were voting for Germany to invade Brussels, which in bourgeois society is a crime. Like, in other words, they were complicit in, in this. And uh, this created a huge crisis in the Second International. And, um, uh, one of the uh, issues that it did was it led to a split. So coming into the German Revolution, there's already multiple Marxist parties throughout the world. So the SPD. Uh, it is important to point out that the SPD was not against socialism per se. While Ebert and Scheidman were part of the conservative side of the SPD, so Frederick Ebert and Philip Scheidman, I'm going to talk about in a little second. They were part of, they were conservatives and they were even social chauvinists during the war. Uh, they did not want fascism or something like that. You know, it's not like they're secret Nazis or something. They really did believe that this was the path to socialism. They rather thought that they could utilize conservative elements, and since politics is a game, it is an art of the deal, uh, that is not in principle wrong. Politics is how to use your opponent. Right? It's actually literally about using your opponent, not you know, accommodating to them, but getting them to play for you. So three issues uh, for them were that um, they were dependent on the existing military apparatus. So from their standpoint, the workers' movement was too weak. And that's not some arbitrary thought. This was uh, 1918, and uh, Germany was defeated in World War I. They were starving in Germany. And the SPD basically was smashed because of the war, right? They had lost political legitimacy amongst a lot of people because they voted for, at the time, the most horrifying thing in human existence, right? We, we're not at World War II yet, okay? But World War II, for people who saw World War I were like, this is the continuation as it is. Right? It's a real meat grinder of nihilism. Um, second of all, the other thing that they feared is that if they were to make a revolution, they would have to probably go to war with England or France. In other words, not only did they just lose World War I, from their standpoint at least, if they were to do anything too revolutionary, England would invade, the U.S. would invade, right? Woodrow Wilson would invade. So from their standpoint... So you kind of see that with Russia, especially with like, the Russian Civil War. Right, so the Russian Civil War is like already happening. You know, Russia's already getting invaded at this time. Because uh, Russia had its uh, October Revolution in 1917, and one of the first things they did is they um, abolished the indemnities that they were going to pay to the Entente, and that's a crime in bourgeois society. Right? They literally said, fuck you, I'm not paying your debts. And so they were invaded by 22 countries in that sense. And so, uh, you know, Germany doesn't want to repeat that. Um, that's their reading. I'm not saying whether or not this is right or wrong. I'm just saying what their reading of things are. And finally, the SPD, uh, they had an idea that they could play the military 
In other words, they thought that the military, since it had delegitimized itself, would have to kind of put in their reforms. Right? They would actually have to, even if they didn't want to, they'd have to be kind of socialists. Like they, you know, they didn't expect that Ludendorff and Gromier were going to like say, yeah, I'm into Marx now. But whether or not they liked it in order to recover their legitimacy amongst the public, they would have to support things. So that's their view, at least in this case. And this sentiment was actually shared amongst another group that emerged called the USK and this is the independence. And I've already mentioned Karl Kautsky, but he's going to be in this group over here. So this is the this is the old guard. Right, so Ebert, actually these people are younger, and they grew up in the uh, party. And this is Karl Kowski, who's actually more the old guard. And the U.S. could actually kind of share that sentiment. Um, they had this view like, okay, at least we're in power, why are you calling strikes and all these reforms? You could fuck everything up. That's kind of their view. Um, so for Ebert and Scheidemann, uh, they actually had a Marxist explanation for what they were doing. What's the kind of famous thing about Marxism that it gets attacked a lot? That the political is a expression of the economic. And so they said, well, if we're in economic straits, then our political horizons are lower. And so they decided, just like Karl Marx said, that's why we're doing what we're doing. You know, it's not as simple as they were like, we're against Marx all of a sudden. They're like, no, this is we want socialism. And we're following Marx. That's capital, whatever. Um, so from them to try to do things that were beyond the development of the economy, flew in the face for them for Marxism. Even. So it's very important to keep this in mind as we're talking about this today, because what's happening in Germany in 1918, 1919, is literally a civil war in Marxism. It's not just like the bad guys are there and the good guys are here. The end. It's actually that what now has a lot of calumny thrown on it could justify itself on Marxism. And that's the depth of the question. I'm not saying whether or not they're right. I'm saying that's the depth of the question. The USPD uh, over here was made up of dissidents of the SPD. So a lot of them, like Karl Kowski, they weren't for the war. But during the war, they kind of gave theories to cover things up. So we actually read it at the last Platypus reading group. We read the imperialism pamphlet. And so Aaron, what did Karl Kowski say? With respect to what? To the war's ultra-imperialism. OK. Yeah. So in other words, for Karl Kowski, World War I was there was a bad clique got involved in things and uh, launched a war. But they've delegitimized themselves, and in the future we'll have something like ultra imperialism or like a League of Nations, which is what sort of ended up happening. And so he kind of treated the war as not necessitating anything, but just sort of um, a very unfortunate accident. So they emerged in opposition during the war, um, they kind of had a pacifist position. And uh, they eventually split. They were actually kind of kicked out in 1917, although they would eventually fuse with the SPD in 1922. So at the end of this whole, this whole kind of mess. Um, on the day that the SPD took power, the USPD proposed conditions for entering into a government with the SPD. Uh, these included recognizing the German state as a socialist republic, and that a coalition government would only be formed for three days. Was, was the USPD really significant yes. as a the political power? They were more significant than the Spartacus Bund. Okay. Yeah. When when we talk about the Soviets, Rosa Luxemburg had a sit, stand in the back and they were not represented at all. Okay. Whereas there was a parody between the USPD and SPD. Yeah. So there's a famous incident where Hugo Haas gets up and gives a speech and then soldiers rush him and they force a parody that it has to be like three SPD members and three but you know, this is one of these things as well about the, the sort of legacy of Rosa Luxemburg. It's like, you know, because we watched the movie a few weeks ago, people kind of project that like she's right in the center of it. Spartacus Plund is like actually overhyped in a lot of ways, and that's a really unfortunate thing. Any other questions right now? What's the fundamental difference between the SPD's position and the USPD's position? Uh, Second International? 
Well, so the, uh, that's a good question. They, I don't know, they're like more militant, they think. They think they're more socialist. The way that Karl Kautsky describes it in one of his articles is they have a different tempo, but don't really fundamentally disagree. They're both reformists. So it's, it's, yeah. Well, no one says that. Right. Again, that's our job. we have to be very careful about that. It's not like when anyone's like, I'm a reformist. It's like, that's... Yeah, well, you got to you got to view it as a, a sort of part of the times, right? He was a, he was a monarchist. He might have claimed he was a socialist, but he sure. was a monarchist. I mean, he he probably shed a tear or two when when Kaiser William abdicated. Oh yeah, you know, it's like so. It's just Kowski was no Ebert, 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 yeah, no, he did. Yeah. Frederick Ebert in particular did not even want the Kaiser to abdicate. Right. So yeah. right. So do you have like an unevenness of consciousness, right? You'd say Marxist terms. You had from if people that are a lot more politically developed than... Right. And how they hold on to the forms that existed in the change mm -hmm. that they might demand in the governmental form. Right. So, um, I think I put this in a, not at the right place in my... I, I have this kind of later, but I'll come back to them. I'll just put their names up here. There was an issue that Germany coming out of World War I, how to preserve the honor of the military. This is what the concern of a lot of the generals were, in particular Ludendorff. And they kind of, basically politics is the game of using people. And the SPD thought they could use the old German high command, and the old German high command thought they could use the socialists. And from their perspective, they were like, we're gonna have socialists come and take over the government in order to cover for the military. And so when you're talking about uh, Frederick Ebert and the Kaiser, at first he was like, oh, I don't want the Kaiser abdicating, that's gonna cause you know, he, he didn't even want like any revolution to happen. And this is why Ebert, a lot of times, he maintains contact with the old generals. He has a, there's a secret phone line that he's talking to the old generals with. And he'll say kind of two things. He'll be like, I don't want a socialist revolution to happen. And then go to the councils and go, we've completed our revolution. Okay, so there's a real, he's, in his view, he's trying to do a balance act. That makes sense to me. Yeah. So, uh, actually, that's my next line. So um, the SPD basically rejected the USPD on the government being temporary because workers' councils kind of emerged. I'll talk a little bit about the history in a bit, but I just wanted to give an overview of these groups. Uh, from the SPD's view, they had already accomplished much in a few days. They got a People's Republic, there's equal suffrage, um, including for women, uh, socialist national government, and from their standpoint, it was order was what was necessary. In other words, we've preserved gains, don't mess it up. That's actually a reference, but that's another issue. Uh, the USPD put the story slightly different. Uh, the SPD for them was dazed by the revolution. They were kind of caught off guard and required the USPD to help it form a coalition government. Hence, from the USPD's perspective, they hold decisive influence. So they kind of said the only reason this could take power is because we're there. So you can see everybody is claiming control. Right? The SPD is saying we got it. The USPD is saying they got it because we're here. And from the military perspective, they're like, actually, we're playing all these people. And that's what politics is. Okay? Um, the existing government for the USPD could only exist based on the affirmation of the councils. Um, so the councils, and these are just Soviets, right? Or for us, we would probably call them municipal groups. They could be called whatever. Um, in fact, just the day before the USP Day's announcement about decisive influence, uh, the international group renamed itself the Spartacus Fund and published an article calling all workers to take power into their own hands and organize the power new front. So there's already three perspectives on what's happening. This raises the first question. What was the role of the councils? So is everybody familiar at least with the term Soviets? You've heard of it. I mean, maybe you're in middle school history and they said the Soviet Union's bad or something. Soviets are just local dem democratic forms. Like a Houston Soviet would just be city council. City council would go down, everybody goes down. Everyone you don't like is there, everyone you like is there. You know what I mean? Like it's just a democratic form. You talk about bike paths. 
we talk about bike thing, <laughs> electricity. So one of the issues that's happening in Germany once the revolution breaks out is they're like, oh, we don't have a government anymore, so we need to like govern in Berlin. We need to govern in Bavaria and Munich. Um, so this raises the first question about what was the role of the councils. This situation almost, I don't want to overemphasize it, but just oh, almost mirrors what Lenin and Trotsky experienced in 1917, the dual power. So the USPD is claiming you guys only have power because there are councils that are saying, yes, we support you. The councils almost entirely supported the SPD at the time. Similarly, uh, when the Soviets emerged in Russia in 1917, they almost all supported the landlords. Like the first Soviets that emerged were like for the Octoberists, it's like Gushkov and them. And they actually received praise in the English press. So the Soviets emerged in Russia, and the English press are like, the economists. It's like, yes, democracy, the people. So, you know, today they have a kind of connotation to them because we have the Cold War and everything, but at the time they just looked like local democratic forms. Uh, what was the reason for this? So, uh, quoting Lenin, uh, the reason is insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletarians and peasants. The mistake, and Lenin puts it in quotes, meaning that's what it appears like, of the leaders I have named lies in their petty bourgeois opposition. And the fact that instead of clarifying the minds of the workers, they are befogging them. Instead of dispelling petty bourgeois illusions, they are instilling them. Instead of freeing the people from bourgeois influence, they are strengthening their influence. Uh, it should be clear from this why our comrades too make so many mistakes when putting the question simply, should the provisional government be overthrown immediately? My answer is, it should be overthrown, for it is oligarchic, bourgeois, and a people's government, and is unable to provide peace spread or full freedom. Same thing is happening in Germany this time. It cannot be overthrown just now, for it is being kept in power by a direct and indirect, a formal and actual agreement with the Soviets and workers' deputies, and primarily with the chief Soviet, the Petrograd Soviet. Again, Germany, 1918, November. The, you know, these high command coalition with the SPD and the USPD is also being kept in power by the councils. And then three, generally it cannot be overthrown in the ordinary way. For it rests on the support given to the bourgeoisie by the second government, the Soviet of Workers' Deputies. And that government is the only possible revolutionary government which directly expresses the mind and will of the majority of the workers and peasants. Humanity has not evolved and we do not yet know a type of government superior to and better than the Soviet of Lula. To become a power, the class conscious workers must win the majority to their side. So again, if a Houston Soviet was to show up, it wouldn't be necessarily good in itself, it would just create an opportunity. And create an opportunity for bad things as well. As long as no violence is used against the people, there is no other road to power. We are not Blancius. We do not stand for the seizure of power by a minority. We are Marxists, we stand for the proletarian class struggle, blah, blah, blah. Right. So the important point is that the dual power is not an intermediate step but rather reflects the contradictory character of the democratic revolution. It is not that one government reflects the laborers and the other is capital. No. More democracy does not mean more proletarian. It also means more capital. And with this running point. The dual power, I think, has become somewhat mystified today. For example, just last year, the Marxist Center, which is a multi-tenancy initiative of many millennial Marxist tendencies, published a document called All About That Base. Uh, and it had a frequently asked questions on dual power. The first question reads, what does dual power mean? The answer, dual power is both a type of institution and a strategy to change the world. Dual power means new, independent institutions for people to meet their own needs in ways capitalism and the government can't or won't. Unlike nonprofits, where a board of directors makes the decisions, Dual power institutions are created and controlled by the people they benefit. By developing them, people create a second kind of economic, social, and even political power separate from the government and capitalism. And then in parentheses, that's what the dual means in duality with the current system. These new community institutions then govern themselves using participatory democracy, which means that everyone plays an active part in decision making. So that was from the frequently asked questions. Okay, so here's my response. 
the dual power is, we kind of project things that we experience today back onto it. And I think it looks today like it's some kind of community control. And, uh, or it looks like, a, you know, some kind of thing that is somehow outside of capitalism. But the dual power was not community control. It was not like some local community control, but rather reflected the fact that the democratic revolution could uphold two different rights. So if we could think, going back to the French Revolution, there would be like one provisional government. There were two provisional governments, basically. There was the German provisional government, and then there were the councils. And this reflected the fact that the executive itself, the executive prerogative, was contradictory. So I think what happens today is people kind of make like a, it's an intermediate step. And this leads to a kind of view that what you do is you kind of build up a lot of community control, and then you're like halfway there. And they actually end up taking kind of the same perspective of the bourgeois revolutions, where literally the burghers in the town built up, I don't know, community control over Paris or whatever, and then had a political revolution. It's rather that the dual power was the effect rather than the cause or the next step. So this is one way in which... It's a condition, I guess you could say. It's like a condition where like both elements have kind of like a near equal legitimacy. They do have equal legitimacy, yeah. And that's why you know the issue wasn't that... Um, that's actually the expression of the contradictory standpoint, which is that you know, Lenin will say something like, in St. Petersburg or Moscow, there are no police, because literally the, the workers are the, arming themselves and upholding the right, and then they're like upholding the bourgeois government at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's not merely something like, you know, it's not a mere thought thing that you just change or something like that. It's that they are not yet politically organized in order to run the whole nation or something like that. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the other issue with the dual power is it comes out of a crisis in the state. So it's not something that you just kind of build up and then kind of get there. It's literally in Germany, the Kaiser abdicated and something had to step in. In Russia, you know, it was the Tsar abdicated. And so the dual power that kind of springs up there is it's almost like two revolutions happening at once. In uh, the Franco-Prussian War, right, so when we talk about the Paris Commune, this is a stretch on my part. It's almost like there's a dual power emerges there, because you have the bourgeoisie in Versailles, and then you have the proletariat in, the, in Paris. It's a little bit more of a stretch because they're directly antagonistic. Whereas what's happening here is uh, the SPD just has control in the councils the whole revolution. It's a stretch because it's like, it's more, you could just like extract like oh the dual power could be like between countries or something like that. It's because the dual power rests also on ideological notions of politics. That's the Lenin point right there. Meaning it didn't just exist because it was just an army balancing each other. Mm -hmm. It's that the Soviets were upholding um, the Octoberist government. They were saying that's the legitimate government and didn't want to take political responsibility. In Germany at the time, the councils, some people wanted to have all power to the councils, but the SPD was running the councils, and so the SPD's government, the provisional government, was supported by the councils. So you can't just put it at like, you know, there's a political side to it, is my point. Whereas today, I think what people do is they see the structure of, let's say, whatever emerged in Berlin at this time, and went, well, why don't I just start building that today? I don't know. Like, for instance, would like Israel and Palestine be considered like a dual power? Or no, something? I mean, Palestine is just directly colonized by Israel, right? Yeah. No, I mean, this is like, you know, literally, the USPD has something to it when they say your legitimacy rests on the councils, and that's why it's, you know, Lenin saying that this is an ideological battle. So, I, you know, I just wanted to make that point about the dual power because I. My point of pulling out that quote was that today people kind of apply things out of context and they apply the effect as a cause. Yeah, well, it's, it definitely stemmed, like you said, from that political vacuum. Right? It was a race to declaring, on one hand, declaring the sort of the bourgeois democracy, the Weimar Republic, and 
while the internet was declared a socialist republic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of... but my next thing is on the Spartacus slate. So, right. you know, yeah. when uh, there's a famous incident that you're referring to when Philip Scheidman, he's having lunch with Frederick Ebert, and there's like a crowd gathers outside, and he goes out and he goes, Long live the republic. And literally, Frederick Ebert's like, What the fuck? Like, we're not a republic? <laughs> like, and now he has to say he's a republic? Like, you know, he like really said the wrong thing. And then two hours later, Carl Liebknecht, and we watched him in the Rosa Luxemburg movie, he gets up there with, I mean, some other place with a red flag and says, long live the Socialist Republic. So you really have a situation where a lot of things are happening. I feel like it's necessary to kind of uh, make distinct, you know, Wilhelm from Carl. From Carl Wilhelm from Carl? Liebknecht. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I think... Wilhelm was with, was, was with the SPD, and then Carl was his son, I think, mm-hmm. and then he was with the Spartacists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Wilhelm was friends with Karl Marx, and has some funny stories about Karl Marx getting into our fights. So, um, the Spartacist League. Uh, the Spartacist League was, in fact, hyped more by its enemies than by support among the masses. So, there's something called Spartacus Week today, which is supposed to be January 5th or the 12th. Is this, you know, like this whole uprising that happened was ascribed to the Spartacus Fund when they were partly responsible and also partly not responsible. Uh, the League was made, for example, uh, Carl Liebknecht was expelled from the SPD in 1916 for his opposition to the war. So he opposed voting for war credits going against his own party that his father helped found and made front page news in the US. It was in the like, New York Times of German socialists opposed to the war. Um, his speech against voting for war credits. Also, this phrase you hear today, I hear it all the time from a lot of activists, the real enemy is at home. That's Carl Liebknecht. That's from his speech, the real enemy is at home. Like in other words, when you know, the US will do something in Syria, I don't hear someone say that. This comes from Carl Liebknecht. Uh, at the end of the day, Rosa Luxemburg's point was the contradictory character of the revolution. It wasn't that Rosa Luxemburg was more humanist than Ebert, but rather that she knew the dialectical relationship between the political and economic spheres. In other words, Rosa Luxemburg did want to defeat her political enemies and establish her power. Absolutely. God bless her. Um, So quoting Marx from the Paris Commune, uh, the political rule of the producer cannot coexist with the perpetration of his social slavery. And then quoting Trotsky from Results and Prospects, uh, to flee before the organized opposition of capital would be a bet- greater betrayal of the revolution than a refusal to take power in the first instance. The very fact of the proletariat's representatives entering the government, not as powerless hostages, but as a leading force, destroys the borderline between the maximum and minimum program. That is to say, it places collectivism on one order of the day. Ebert and Scheidemann live on only in complete infamy among the left. The hard left routinely shouts that Bernie Sanders killed Rosa Luxemburg. Right, so apparently they shouted this like some Spartacist League people at a best car some car at some jack of the bar. But this apparent loyalty to the martyr actually betrays her lesson. Hugo Haas, a leader in the independent socialists, believed that Ebert and Schagman were compromised leaders. But Luxemburg found this to be an expression of Haas's underhand policy of drawing, drowning out all inner contradictions of the revolution in an indiscriminate launch. In other words, Hugo Haas was like, get rid of the leaders and put in better people. And Rosa Luxemburg's point was, the way they act is from a specific position. Politics is constituted in a way. Um, yes, while well, Ebert and Scheidemann claimed things like the liberation of the people is completed, this is what they wrote on November 9th, Luxemburg said the same uh, a few days later, uh, what we need, uh, what we need now, is not rejoicing over the accomplishments, not celebrations of victory over the prostrate foe, but rigorous self-criticism and self-marshalling of our strength, so that work now begun can go forward. The war had changed the discontent of the masses, not just for cabinet change, but also for social change. The economic character set up by the political revolution was expected by Rosa Luxemburg. She had already made the point in her famous mass strike pamphlet. Rosa Luxemburg understood the contradictory character of the democratic revolution. Such a change would reverberate in the economic sphere. In other words, a democratic bourgeois revolution gives rights to both the capitalists and the workers. 
And so the only thing the workers are doing when they're going on strikes or something is literally pursuing the exact revolution they just got. You know, this is why 1848 ends in a, uh, in a farce, is because you know the capitalists want democracy, and then so do the workers. And they go, well, maybe we don't want democracy. But they also do want democracy. Right? They still do want their rights. And so the, the famous mass strike pamphlet, where she talks about the economic and political character of things and how they relate, is picking up on how things are different than the previous you know, classical democratic revolutions. So you know, Rosa Luxemburg would write things at this time like, the ice is breaking up. Strikes have begun. A revolution has taken place. It was made by workers, by workers, proletarian in and out of uniform. So in uniform, the soldiers. Socialist workers' representatives sit in the government. And what has changed for the masses of workers and their daily wages and living standards? Nothing at all, or very little. In other words, the point wasn't like, I don't know, you don't put in the right reforms, but the point is that you're trying to claim this is a revolution that it's not. Right? They're trying to act like it's a democratic revolution. They're trying to act like it's a democratic revolution. It is a democratic revolution, but now with a contradictory character. The class struggle. And so you can't actually just say, let's just build democracy or something like that. The very act of doing so is going to drive and intensify the contradiction greater. So it's not that Rosa Luxemburg is just saying strikes are good. She's actually not saying whether or not it's good or bad. She's saying that's what's going to happen. You can't expect people to be like, oh, we have our workers in power, and you know they're going to not help us out or something. Right? That's the that's the trust point. Because you can't you know it's, you can't expect them to not then appeal to the workers' government who's claiming that liberation is complete and that we have the proletarian power. Of course not. So um, you know the SPG in response to wanting to build democracy and not you know ruin everything because they found the strikes to be potentially. Uh, um, what's the word? Uh, potentially uh, messing up the negotiations, right? With the the Entente, the peace treaties, uh, they relied on the high command, right? The high general command. And I said, can we have some of your military force put down the strikes or something like that, right? And from their perspective, again, it's not that they're like we're not for socialism. It's that this is going to ruin everything, right? You know. There's a famous Marx phrase, insurrection is an art. It's like a revolution is an art. It's a judgment. You know what I mean? And from the SPD's perspective, it's too early. From their perspective, it's maybe a more middle position. And from the Spartacist League position, you know, now's the time. And now's the time because we have Russia that's sitting by. Right? So everything that Rosa Luxemburg writes in Russia in 1917, 1918, whatever the criticisms, they all say it's all the fault of the German proletariat. That in order to save Russia, we need to make a revolution here. Everything. Or the, the polemic she wrote in prison, and the later thing that she wrote in 1918, she says Russia posed the question to Germany that it can't answer. And it's our duty. Like, you know, in other words, Luxembourg's not, you know, she says maybe they could have done this better or something like that, but she goes, we owe it to them. You know, any, any of the uh, police things that happened there, the Cheka, whatever, it's the fault of the German Revolution. That's the Luxembourg point. Okay, so here's then the next line. Uh, the influence of Russia. Any questions before I? Yeah, yeah I'm just saying there's a reason for that, obviously, right? Even Lenin realized that, because Russia was a backwards country, oh, yeah. agrarian-based country. So the proletariat protocol that was really didn't, didn't oh, it only existed in some of the big urban centers, right? Absolutely. So they knew a big, ed, at the time Germany had the most educated, most advanced proletariat. They knew, they knew that without the fall of a country like Germany, they wouldn't be able, or, you'd, or, or, or then you have the counter revolution in, in, the, in, the, in the term, in, in the face of, in the, in the um, 
Right. What I'm trying to say, like it's Stalinism, basically. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Have, you have sort of your own thermidor and mm -hmm. what I would argue is kind of a counter revolutionary Absolutely, yeah. Would, because, yeah, but then the whole socialism in one country forced, you know, forced labor and all that stuff. Yeah, socialism in one country is an accommodation to the failure of the revolution. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Right. So, like, in other words, the 20th century, like, you know, this, this what, what am I doing here in this teaching today? I'm just trying to say that all of the horrors of the 20th century can be traced to the failure of this revolution. Yeah. Like, in other words, I, this, I'll just read this last quote because you just brought it up just from Adorno writing in 1962. I mean, in a way, could he argue that lay the seeds for Hitler, right? He could even argue that. Oh, oh, okay, so what happens November 9th? Adolf Hitler has a mental breakdown. He's a soldier, he's a lance corporal in the German military. And uh, he ends up buying Ludendorff's stat in the back net. So in other words, Ludendorff, uh, he plays the socialists and gets them to take responsibility for the government, and then turns around and goes, we lost the war because of the socialists. That literally, we, were, we could have won at the front, they stabbed us in the back. So, you know, again, politics is about using your enemies, and the SPD got played. They got played directly. So Ludendorff, it was his plan to bring in the SPD, and then turns around, he writes books on stab in the back, they influenced Hitler very strongly. They got, Hitler got other things from Ludendorff as well, like he's into mysticism from him and stuff like that. But um, yeah, fascism, Stalinism, directly comes out of this failure. That's that's the that's the terrible truth. Yeah. Yes. Could you talk about how socialism in one country uh, was an accommodation to the failure of the German Revolution? How uh, on the German Revolution is so tied to the Russian Revolution's success? Well, so, you know, it's a few things. So one, uh, one of the reasons why Lenin said now is the time was precisely because there were mutinies in the Navy in Germany. In other words, everything he's writing in the fall of 1917, it goes, oh, we can make this revolution. I think we read this a few summers ago, can the Bolsheviks retain state power? He says, one of the responses is, aren't we going to be invaded if we make a revolution? And Lenin says, no, because we're starting a revolution in West Europe, and they'll come to our help. That's what the expectation was. So the accommodation there is one of, um, it's turning a defeat into a victory. That's the crime of Stalinism right there. I mean, authoritarianism is bad. No one wants that. But a revolution is authoritarian, right? So it could have been justified if humanity was emancipated. Like if you, if this ended up working, for example, we might have talked about this history as it was terrible, you know, but it was tragic. It was something authoritarian that had to happen such that our generation and future generations could be free. The problem with Stalinism is it treated what was the whole point, right, that Russia was the toxin of revolutions. It treated it as if the goal was always just a revolution in Russia and said, no, we have victory. And of course, you can, you know, Stalin scoured Lenin and said, well, combined an uneven development, that's how we can have socialism in one country, whatever. That's not the point. The point is that Stalin actually found um, weight in Russia because the Russian socialists didn't want to wait for another revolution to happen. They kind of grew tired of it, you know. In this period from 1918 to, let's just say, 1924, there are like 500 attempts at a revolution. It's just like, they just keep trying. And it's exhausting to people. And people don't want to hear about defeats. They want to hear about victories. You know, it's much easier to get people to get on your side if you say, we're victorious. Shiny, happy people. We have socialism here. We have achieved great victories. Defeat is horrible to kind of look at, right? And Rosa Luxemburg, that's her kind of courage right there in her last piece, is to say, look, all of Marxism is a history of defeats, and to remind them about that. The whole point is that we've advanced their defeats. That doesn't mean praising defeats, but defeats are only a problem at the end of the day if you stop learning. Stalinism was a way for people to stop learning by saying, you know, we've accomplished it. So the socialism in one country, it's not that Stalin thought up some theories. The theory was the reflection of actually the accommodation to the political defeat. So I think Trotsky says the passivity of the masses. You know, you have, you have like peasants who are starving, where cannibalism is coming back in Russia. 
a civil war in Russia. And you know, they're looking to their communists and they're going, when is this revolution happening in Germany that's supposed to free us? I don't want to hear. You know, there's something wrong with them. West Europe's bourgeois. I don't want to talk about it. So he found he found the popular discontent. You know, like that's that's the real horrifying truth. It would have been great, you know, if the problem was just some bad person, but of course, that's not the issue. I don't know if that oh, my next card is on Russia. Any other questions right now? I mean feel free to jump in all the time because I'm just gonna observe that. Um it, it it's uh, like for this thing to push forward past its you know condition of, of politics at the time is really like messy. Like it, you don't know where it goes, and um, I mean it's just like this unreasonable trust walk. Maybe my observation. Unreasonable trust walk. Yeah, like so you're blind and you're trusting that Marxism is going to like lead you to. A free society or something. Okay. It didn't even get that far, but my point is, like, just in your explanation, you know, my response is that's messy. You know, like that's that's a hard thing to to like to, to stand on. To turn to someone who's got your answer, immediate answer, and say we're going in a different direction. We don't know where we're going. I mean, it's life and death stuff. You know? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, and it's also. Uh, yeah, let me keep going, because I'm glad fascism and Stalinism showed up as well, because it's not, the, the German Revolution was the hope of the whole thing. Um, and of course, it's one of these things that, you know, we're going to read left-wing communism in two weeks, the famous Lenin pamphlet, and he's just going to say at the beginning that we're in a retreat right now. And he said retreats are more dangerous than victories, because he puts it as a mountain. So going up a mountain is easy. Right? It feels great, you're like accomplishing something. And he goes, going down a mountain, you have the gravity against you. And so there's more of an opportunity to fall. And yeah. It, it is sort of a tragedy that it is so kind of, the, the whole revolution is so kind of overlooked as being the epicenter of the whole kind of tragedy of the 20th century, mm -hmm. especially with regards to Stalinism and fascism. And it's like, yeah, it, 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 it implicates uh, Marxism in the way that um, uh -huh. <laughs> in, in for the, the kind of awfulness of all the 20th century, which kind of necessitates a redemption. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, the real Marxist way to, you know, this is why we read the Reich. So we read Wilhelm Reich in the fall. And he's just like, if you want to understand fascism, you need to understand the German freedom movement. You know, just for him, he's just saying fascism was the failure of Marxism. And that is the Marxist way to look at it, and not to say it's just bad or something. You actually have to approach things concretely and dialectically and say, is it possible for Marxism to turn into fascism? Well, it did. Mussolini. Mussolini, you know, I have a quote from the Doctrine of Fascism, if I keep going. He just goes, oh, fascism has superseded all of... Marxism and socialism and liberalism. Like he thinks it's like the next stage of things. Right? It's like better than all of them. Um, okay, so the influence of Russia. A year before November 9th, 1918 was the Russian Revolution. So actually the anniversary of the Russian Revolution, the October Revolution, is the German Revolution. So it's directly related. It's actually, they have a protest or you know, a celebration in favor of it. Um, the toxin for world revolution had sounded in Russia and had already spread, albeit slowly, into Hungary and Finland. The specter of Bolshevism uh, was already hunting uh, the streets. Uh, for the rest of the 20th century and up until today, Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin have been pitted in popular history on opposite sides. Luxemburg is the humane democratic socialist who believes in creativity and spontaneity of ordinary people to overcome the oppressions that face them. Lenin, on the other hand, is the ends justify the means, authoritarian, hierarchical, socialists, willing to hijack any popular revolution and sign any hanging order for his lust for power and control. I mean, this is like the Chomsky thing or something. Um, and according to the socialist Kerensky, apparently he was like this in his childhood. So one of the people that Lenin overthrew, they were like, you know, elementary school students together or something. Uh, in a letter written to Adolf Warsky at the end of the following year, when she had received better information, Luxembourg wrote, the use of terror in Russia indicates great weakness. 
Certainly, but it is directed against internal enemies who base their hopes on the existence of capitalism outside of Russia, receiving support and encouragement from it. With the coming of the European Revolution, the Russian counter-revolutionaries will lose not only their support from abroad, but also, what's more important, their courage. Thus, the Bolshevik use of terror is above all an expression of the weakness of the European proletariat. For Luxembourg, in her revised critique of the Russian tragedy, and so she wrote a pamphlet in prison, the difficulty with the Russian Revolution was the insolubility of the problem posed to them by the international, above all the German proletariat. It followed that the honor of the Russian Revolution was identical with vindicating that of the German proletariat and international socialists. Even in her prison writings, Luxembourg never lost sight of the international character of the October Revolution. So maybe I shouldn't even say Russian Revolution, I'll just say October Revolution. The opportunists in Germany, on the other hand, treated the October Revolution as a Russian Revolution. So we were just talking about the backwardness, they would say, well, that was Russia. You know, like they have their own laws. Karl Kautsky says, we have a German Revolution, not a Russian Revolution. Stalinism's the other side of it. It says, well, we could make a revolution because of the conditions of Russia. And that's why they didn't work in Germany. Right, so we read Althusser last summer, and he goes, well, only Russia had the overdetermined thing, not Germany. Stalinism. It's breaking the international revolution down into little national effects. Theoretically, Luxembourg says, this doctrine follows from the original Marxist discovery that the socialist revolution is a national, and so to speak, a domestic affair in each modern country taken by itself. Of course, in the blueness of abstract formulae, as Akowski knows very well how to trace the worldwide economic connections of capital, which make all of the modern countries into a single integrated organism. The problems of the Ru Russian Revolution cannot possibly be solved within the limits of bourgeois society. Practically, the, this same doctrine represents an attempt to get rid of any responsibility for the course of the Russian Revolution. Right? So again, Kautsky is saying we have a German Revolution, he actually just calls them illiterates in Russia. It's like really, you know, he really becomes very base. And likewise, you know, Stalin is later going to say, well, we have conditions in Russia that they didn't have in Germany. Could you also kind of say the same thing about this, the, the general bourgeois revolution before the, before like 1918, like, like with respect to America and France? Like, okay. Like, it's sort of like international. They, yeah, the, the, so the English, American, and French revolutions were international. Yeah. You know, bourgeois society is a cosmopolitan society. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, you know, the French Revolution is uh, invaded by England. Right? It can't just happen in the bounds of France. Uh, usually with, in the kind of classical Marxist literature, they'll say a national revolution in quotes. Mm -hmm because it takes the appearance of the people. They say, well, who's the nation? It's those who are subject to the laws. So again, the Abbey says, the priests are not subject to the laws. They're not part of our nation. But today, the nation state means something a little bit different. So the 19th century and 20th centuries uh, bring back the state in a way that's different than the 18th century. So that's why we read the state and revolution, right? So the special bodies of armed men, the police, that's new in human history. That's a new thing, and it reflects capitalism. So you're right to say, you know, was it the American and English Revolution or French revolutions? Weren't they always international? Absolutely. And, you know, the problem, again, even with Stalinism, they'll say we're internationalists. It's not like they would say we're against an international revolution. It's rather how they accommodate to things. It's the opportunism of practice. Is it in terms of, like, stages, I guess? They put it in stages, and in terms of they treat nations as separate. So, you know, we were, let's see, we've done a few different things about this, from the mass strike to the results in prospects. You know, the, these countries, why is Russia the weakest link in imperialism? It's like invested in by France and England and Germany, and Russia's inv investing in other countries. You know, everything's tied together in that sense. So there is no country, you know, even North Korea today is not like you know, independent of the rest of the world. Everything is interdependent. Do you have a question? No, okay. Um, so attempt to get rid of the responsibility. 
Uh, but this influence wasn't just one of responsibility, but also an insight into the future. As Lenin remarks at the beginning of his pamphlet, Left Wing Communism, from 1920, the international significance of the October Revolution at the time was the international validity or historical inevitability of a repu repetition on an international scale of what has taken place in our country. One of Rosa Luxemburg's most impressive feats was the extent by which she learned from the experience of Russia and was already pursuing the problems raised in her very brief period. The titles of her articles in the brief period, and she's only out of jail for just two months before she's murdered, uh, shows the thought pattern. So November 9th, she writes The Beginning. Uh, a few weeks later, she writes The Asherin in Motion, and in it she talks about the ISIS breaking up because strikes had broken out as she expected. And then finally in December, what does the Spartacus League want? Which, P.S., when Lenin was making preparations for the Third International, he told his uh, comrade to just take some theses on Bolshevism and just take Luxembourg's speech, and that's going to be the program. So he directly read what she was writing the entire time. And then finally, her final piece, The Order Reigns in Berlin, where she says, now the task of the overthrow of Ebert and Scheidemann has been posed. Now this almost directly mirrors what happens in Russia. In other words, the February Revolution breaks out, and Lenin's in Switzerland, which we watched Fall of Eagles last week, and uh, he writes some letters from afar and says, okay, let's see how these things are going. You know, this is the first stage. He comes back, he arrives April 4th, my birthday in Russia, and he publishes his April theses, and that's kind of like the Spartacus program. Um, and then he experiences the July days, which is a revolution that's too early, right? It's an uprising that's too early, and it leads to him almost being shot. And that's kind of like the Christmas uprising in Germany. And then he writes State Revolution in Hiding in Finland, and that's kind of like Rosa Luxemburg's The Order Rings in Berlin. The task has been posed. And so there's really a repetition of things that are happening on this global stage. And this doesn't mean it exists for all time, but they'll say for that historical epoch, that's going to repeat. It's because they have similar preceding histories. You want to say something? Okay. But this influence was also negative. The SPD, for example, said that Bolshevism was the militarism of loafers. From the perspective of left communists, such as Herman Gorder, Panikok, or Otto Rule, the Bolsheviks incorrectly generalized from their standpoint. So the left comms would say, well, you and Russia had a lot of peasants, and they just wanted their land, so you guys could just use them, and we don't have that in Germany. So we don't have the same conditions what do for that. Karl Kautsky's view uh, was that the USPD and SPD differed only in tempo, that the SPD was a little bit more cautious. He rather thought that a real enemy was the Spartacus League, who he thought were reified. So writing in December of 1918, Kautsky writes, the previous revolutions of the 19th century were all bourgeois in their origin. However, since the bourgeoisie has only a limited ability to fight by itself, all these revolutions were brought about by the energetic intervention of the classes beneath them, the petty bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Initially, the bourgeoisie took possession of state power and used it for its own ends. They could not assuage the petty bourgeoisie and the proletariat who had become acquainted with their own power in the revolutionary struggles. They used the power to drive the bourgeoisie forward in order to eventually set up a government devoted to the poorer classes of the people. In this way, the struggles between the classes inevitably drove the revolution forward and radicalized it. Thus, 1789 was followed by the victory of the mountain. In France, on the 4th of September, 1870, was followed by the 18th of March, 1871, that's the Paris Commune. In Russia, the March Revolution was followed by the November Revolution. So just remember, they have different calendars, so the February and October Revolution. Therefore, the Spartacus people and their friends assume that the current revolution will not stop in its first phase, but that it must enter a second phase, a phase that can represent nothing but a victory for the most radical party, Spartacus League. The Spartacides should be rather more careful in their method of indiscriminately applying templates drawn from the past and from other countries to the Germany of today. Just recently, they tremendously failed when they called the blundering took from Russia all power to the workers and soldiers' councils. The current revolution in Germany has its own laws. So yeah, uh, it differs from all previous revolutions in that it is proletarian and socialist from the outset. So let me just make it. Okay, let me just make this point right here, which is that from Kowski's standpoint, the proletarian is in power. So to call for any 
overthrow is just directly counter-revolutionary, if that makes sense. Right? So you can see how there's a different judgment on things that are happening. Rosa Luxemburg, it's the beginning. Strikes are breaking out. The task has been posed. Kautsky's saying, no, in fact, we are in power. And to say we need to overthrow is to incorrectly use this old template or incorrectly use Russia. And therefore, that's actually counter-revolutionary. So it's not as simple as Karl Kautsky's like, I don't like Marxism anymore or something like that. And Luxembourg is which is sometimes how it's taught, but rather there's a real crisis in Marxism that's happening. There's a civil war that's breaking out in Marxism. So uh, two things to note. One, from his standpoint, the Spartacists were beholden to antiquated ideology. They were incorrectly applying a bourgeois revolution. But a more important thing as well is that Kowski was still beholden to the original view of the party of the class. To have a proletariat fight a proletariat was nothing but wrongheadedness. But the left communists take the same standpoint. They also say something like, well, that's bourgeois and that's proletarian. I don't know. The councils are proletarian and parliamentary democracy is bourgeois or something like that. Um, but this forgets a, you know, a famous thing that Lenin writes in the imperialism pamphlet. There is no Chinese wall separating the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. In fact, both are bourgeois. They're both or urban classes. They're of the same thing. Going back to the Luxembourg at the beginning, the proletariat doesn't create any new property because it is bourgeois. It's a contradiction in bourgeois right. It's an expression of that. It's the personification of that. So the question then for Lenin is, which class of the urban classes will succeed in leading the country, will cope with this task, and what forms will the leadership by the town assume? In other words, will it be Soviets? Will it be factory councils? How will it be done? So it's very clear here that one of the things that's emerging also in this period that Luxembourg is being won over to is, you know, maybe I should give a little bit of background on this. Um, the original second international view of the party was that there's one party for the class, right? There would be one proletarian socialist party. And one of the things that, you know, Lenin's contribution to history is that actually the final battle will be between Marxism and itself. There will be multiple Marxist parties that are all claiming leadership. And that's actually the final battle. That's sort of what the Second International contributed to us. And that's why Lenin, as opposed to Kautsky, was you know, so heartedly pursuing the split in the Second International. Karl Kautsky didn't want there to be a split. And Lenin was saying, no, what August 4th, right that, where? Um, somewhere. Uh, that what August, it is right behind? Yeah, there we go. So what August 4th demonstrated was it posed the question to the international of the necessity to split. Right? In other words, August 4th was the German government, the counter-revolution actually shot first and won. Right? They said, Will you vote for war credits? And that should have been the time for revolution, but instead the German SPD voted for war credits. And that's why Lenin then scours all of Kautsky's writings and goes, didn't you prove that would have been the revolution in 1909, Road to Power? He said, they're going to pose that question. And then it happened, and he went, no, never mind. Right, so the big, the big contribution, the question posed by the Second International is that the final battle would be between Marxists it's not going to be all the bad guys on one side and all the good guys on the other side. There'd be no lesson there. It's going to be everyone saying, I'm following Marxism. They're claiming they're following Marxism. They're claiming they're following Marxism. They're claiming they're following Marxism. Yeah. It's, so it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a deep question right there. And I think, you know, to go back to one of your points earlier, I think people treat it like the problem's been solved. And one of the ways that they do it is they just go, they're not Marxist, they're not Marxist, they're Marxist. Or they're not really Marxist, they're Marxist. And then there is no lesson. You know what I mean? It's, it, there's nothing to learn there. It was just like this deception or something. Um, OK, so lessons. Uh, what Lenin meant by the generalizability of Russia's experience was not tactics, per se, but rather experiences. 
as Lenin put it in a letter to German communists in August 1921, uh, the left communists should in fact remain in the international because they must be allowed to develop both in their own learning but also as an object for inexperienced communists. In other words, Lenin's reading of the left communists is that they were young. They were kind of young people who had seen this horrifying action, betrayal on the part of their leaders, and they kind of learned too narrow of a lesson from it. Right? They kind of reacted too strongly. The West had not experienced a major revolution like the East, and thus there was still something to learn from Russia. This is because, as he put it in the left-wing communism, the Bolsheviks had gone through the experience of defeats and therefore retreat before, in post-1905, the dress rehearsal. In other words, after 1905, they had to learn how to retreat already. There was a period of counter-revolution, Stolp and Duma, the whole thing. This was an experience that needed to be generalized. This is different than what Hermann Gorder, the Dutch communist, criticized Lenin of doing. He felt Lenin was exporting leader tactics to the West and was wrongly generalizing the tactics of the Russian experience. For Hermann Gorder in West Europe, the influence of the party leaders would be less because of the development of capitalist production. In other words, his view was you needed more leaders in Russia because it was more backwards. There, the proletariat in Germany stood alone, were more numerous, and as a result of this, had taken up more responsibility than in Russia where the peasants were coincidentally on the side of the Bolsheviks. Furthermore, the importance of leaders, a party dictatorship, was less relevant since the class would be pressured more. This was the result of imperialism. In the West, imperialism and monopolies had concentrated the classes against the proletariat to a greater degree than it did in Russia. There were more of them, it was more numerous, more concentrated. The petty bourgeois and peasants were not waiting for an agricultural revolution, right? They weren't give us our land or something. Uh, they did not care about having their rent dismissed, but rather were united with big capital to a degree not seen in Russia. While it is true that different countries have different concrete conditions, these conditions are interconnected. As Cliff Slaughter put it, the connection that he's writing in 1960, so it's a little bit different. Uh, the connection between the struggles of the working class for socialism in, say, Britain, Russia, and Vietnam it's not at all in the greater or lesser degree of similarity of social structure of those countries, but in the organic interdependence of their struggles. Capitalism is an international phenomenon, and the working class is an international force. What would have been necessary to demonstrate is not that Germany faced a different set of conditions, but how the difference was the function of the activity of the proletarian class. For example, that the peasants in Russia could be a reliable source of democratic discontents for the Bolsheviks was the result of the growth of the proletariat in West Europe, which led to investment in Russia and their combined and uneven development. In other words, the whole reason you, know, you get Marxism in Russia is because of the strength of it in Germany is causing capital to be exported. Or in France, they're afraid they're going to have a revolution, so they start colonizing other parts of the world or sending their capital elsewhere. On the other hand, the revolution of 1905 put pressure on the German SPD and helped spurn the secret agreement of the trade unions with, with the SPD as a result of their resistance to the growing pressure to become political. In other words, part of what leads to this capitulation in 1914 is the fact that there's already been an attempt at a revolution in Russia in 1905 that frightened the trade unions in Germany and it caused them to kind of do some corrupt bureaucratic things behind the back of the party. And that would increase their influence and control over the party and eventually lead to this capitulation. Because part of the deal for voting for war credits is you would get trade union jobs and money, et cetera, things like that. Um, whether or not the tactics suggested were correct is not only hard to judge, but almost impossible to make sense of today, since such concrete situations do not repeat. Tactics are one's judgment. All the training of Bolshevism for Trotsky was the selection of individuals to make a correct judgment at the right time. It's not a science, it's an art to make a political judgment. What could be generalized, however, is the party's experience, meaning the questions that will be presented inevitably in the development of the party. The problem with the lefts, and this is very consciously in quotes, as Lenin puts it, was that they had, as Lenin put it, an exaggerated Kind of, uh, they sort of exaggerated the threat of centrism. They turned it into sport. 
so as Gorder puts it in a footnote to his letter to Lenin, if in a country so diseased with opportunism the danger should arise of a young communist party falling back into the course of opportunism, then parliamentarianism, uh, it is a tactical necessity to defend anti-parliamentarianism. I think I lost some of my papers somewhere. Oh, here we go. Oh, I'm on the right side. Um, but Gorder and Kowski fell back on reformism in two different but related fashions. So, for example, what would it mean? Uh, yeah, this is right. Okay, so what would this mean? So here's Luxembourg on the National Assembly. Just as we exploited the infamous Prussian three-class franchise to fight against the three-class parliament in the three-class parliament, uh, so we will utilize the elections to the National Assembly to fight against the National Assembly. So Gorder is saying that we shouldn't participate in the parliament, it's bourgeois. And Rosa Luxemburg is saying, well, we do so in order to fight against the influence of it. You know, it's not that we use it for legislation. We do it to prove to people why they shouldn't be in the parliament. Lenin, a year later, commenting on the Constituent Assembly in Russia, wrote, the party of the revolutionary proletariat must take part in bourgeois parliaments in order to enlighten the masses. This can be done during elections and the struggle between parties and parliament. But limiting the class struggle to the parliamentary struggle, or regarding the later as the highest decisive form to which all the other forms of the struggle are subordinate, is actually a desertion to the side of the bourgeoisie and against the proletariat. Some lefts, who I've talked to, uh, believe that the split in the Second International was over parliamentarianism. For example, it literally was that the German parliamentary branch of the SPD voted for war credits. So therefore, the lesson of splitting the Second International was don't be in the parliament, be in the streets, be in factory committees, or something else like that. Otto Rule, for example, believed that parliaments were for the bourgeois era. The betrayal of the leaders of the Second International their capitulation to the opportunism in the party, represented by trade unionism and parliamentarianism, were two sides of the same coin. So in other words, left communism is actually a symptom of learning from Lenin, but learning in a one-sided fashion. Just a few years later, he's already created new obstacles in a way. Um, but Rosa Luxemburg, who is often claimed by a lot of left communists, in fact, believed that the parliament could be used in a certain way. The parliamentary stage, she wrote in her Junius pamphlet, for instance, the only far-reaching and internationally conspicuous platform, could have become a mighty motive power for the awakening of people, had it been used by the social democratic representatives to proclaim loudly and distinctly the interests, the problems, and the demand of the working class. Would the masses have supported the social democracy in its attitude towards the war? In other words, if instead the SPD came out and said, we're not going to vote for the war. That is not a question one can answer, but neither is it an important one. Did our parliamentarians uh, demand an absolute assurance of victory from the generals of the Prussian army before voting in favor of war credits? What is true of military armies is equally true of the revolutionary armies. They go into the fight, wherever necessity demands it, without previous assurances of success. At the worst, the party could have been doomed in the first few months of the war to political ineffectuality. So what Luxembourg is saying right there is they should have voted against war credits, even if the entire mass of people wanted to go to war. And they did. In other words, the workers did want to go to war against Russia. It was the Tsar, right? Babel has a famous quote that he gave uh, prior to, uh, he didn't live to see World War I, but it was something along the lines of, if we go to war with Russia, I myself will pick up a gun. So this is August Babel, the kind of leader in the Second International. And Rosa Luxemburg is saying the duty of them right there should have been to say no, even if it made you unpopular. Right? Of course, you know, like, I bring these things up today because there's kind of this debate happening on, like, I don't know, participating in elections, right, because we're in election season right now. And there's this kind of view that if you do so, you have to participate in a way that gets votes, right, gains seats. And on the other side of it is don't participate at all. And there used to be this other way of, well, you could participate to show the limits of elections or Congress or things like that without being tied to whether or not you want seats. And that seems like an impossibility today. Um, but it was more common back then. Like, in other words, uh, I, so, like, what's the debate around Bernie Sanders, for example? 
It's like you either support the Democratic Party or don't vote at all. And it's like, well, what about there could have been a third option? Well, you could have run as a truly as an independent, right? As a, yeah, right. absolutely. Right. And so you downs, unfortunately. I apologize. what is your? Can we? Can we give you this contact information if you want to? Sure. Um, I don't have anything to write up. Yeah, but just going off that point right there, you know, it would have been this thing today, like... I have to get going, too. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah. I'm going to be on the thing on Monday, though. Okay, yeah, we have a we have a panel on Monday with David Barsamian. Um, yeah. What time is that again? It's at 6 in Agnes Arnold. It's media and the left. Oh, yeah.